My name is Sue Warbican, and I am speaking to you from my exhibition here at Riverviews Art Space in Lynchburg, Virginia. Tell me about the installation and the configuration of the sails behind you. Well, I've been working with sails for, I think, since around 2012 with my work, and I started working on them. It was Actually, no, it was like, I think around 2009 when I started working with them. It was at a residency down at Atlantic Arts Center. And I just was working with this material that was about hurricanes and uh, climate change and, you know, a lot of different things. And uh, I was camping out, actually, in the Outer Banks. And that was before 2009, actually. And there was a hurricane, like a tail end of the hurricane was coming through um, the Outer Banks. And so we had to, you know, fold up the tent and all that. So as the wind was just kind of blowing me around with the tent, I started to think about, you know, fabric and, and wind and stuff like that. So I thought after that experience, I would um, look for a sail to actually work with, which I found down at, in a the Atlantic Center for the Arts, and I began working with that um, subject in my photographs. And then later I had a residency at the Rauschenberg uh, residency, and I worked with an acrobat, which is the, those images over there, and we collaborated on some things. And I just kept, you know, thinking about um, the, like, these forces on our on our earth, right? And so um, when I started to install things, I think the, well, the first biggest one that I did was at uh, the Greater Reston Art Center, which is now Tefra Institute of Contemporary Art in Reston. And I did an installation there with the sales. And, and basically I would practice with them too in other spaces. And it was always about what is the, space going to allow me to do with these objects. And so um, here, um, you know, we worked with the available hooks that were here from a previous show, and that's how we laid things out. So we just sort of followed it very intuitively and let that dictate how things could go. Um, and particularly because we couldn't put in additional hooks, we just let things the way they go. And then a really recent development, here are these chairs, which were fabricated by Michelle Smith, um, who is a, has graduated, just graduated from the School of Art at George Mason University. So I asked her if she would uh, fabricate the sails and I got a little fellowship for her from the Gillespie Fund that was set up, and she worked over the summer to build these, and so it was great. We were able to pay her to do that work, and among other things, she did a lot of other stuff too. She was great. Um, so yeah, that's like the story pretty much of the sales, and I had been thinking about this whole idea of allowing the sales to become something else. And because uh, I had been thinking for a while about what if the sails became shelter, and in this case, they were like a support for someone. So that's where that idea came from. What about the addition of the silk on two of the sails? So the silk, um, that was, that's the latest thing that I, that I did here. And that is just fresh off the printer. <laughs> And that came from me working with uh, the materials that I had uh, had gone through from my mother's paperwork. So she died in 2019, and I was, you know, having to go through all the sensitive information that I didn't want to just throw away. So I shredded it, and I worked with Helen Frederick at Reading Road Studio and Emily Fussner and they showed me how to make paper, and then I cast, I started casting them as fish because I had found a box of these giant fish hooks that were my father's, and I just thought, fish. 
And I like the idea of fish because of movement and because of these little sculptures, I could just kind of, you know, make them flow. And so as I was making those fish, it was during, you know, this past winter and I was thinking about COVID and, you know, you're locked down, you can't really go anywhere. So, um, and then it was a meditative process. So I, I began to think about what if I formed these from clay? What if I started to photograph them? And I started to do that on the kitchen table and I started to see how they could flow. And I thought, and I did a test print on silk just to see what would happen, small little test. And I was like, I laid it on top of the sail one day and I was like, wow. So I think this needs to be bigger. And so as I was working with those black and white photos of the fish and making them kind of flow and stuff, I started looking at it again and thinking about a comet. And I think that the reason why I was thinking about that was because I was really grappling with the loss of two major family members. And it's like, you know, when somebody's gone, where do they go? And that's how I thought about this other space, like out there, right? So that's where the comet, it sort of transformed and working with that material, it just was very intuitive again. And I was just following that intuition. And so that's where those connections came from. So why did you include other pieces like Max and Claire's? Well, you know, I lost my brother right at the same time as my mother. It was like literally six weeks apart. And Matt had gone to art school. Like he was really the first one in the family that went to art school. And he was really influential on me. And um, he had done a show, um, I think it was 1990 in... Um, the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, and his concerns were always around like climate change and things. And he had done this piece here with two other artists, Phil Rostet, who did the sea, and then James Nelson, who did the sky. And it was one of those massive sprawling shows through a lot of rooms and stuff. And then, you know, I was always so impressed with this piece. But Matt never showed it anywhere. Like, and you know, the three of them, I guess, or, you know, just at that one place and Matt had just kept it in storage. And so I always thought, you know, it was so, made such an impression on me. And actually I started to realize too that I was making things that were about that. And, and I thought, um, well, yeah, after he passed, obviously something had to happen here. And, you know, I wish it could have happened before, um, but our minds weren't there. And so this opportunity happened. And so I was invited to have this show last year and COVID. And so that gave me time to really deal with this piece and include it. And I just thought, about how these sales could actually like interact with these pieces. Because there's another one over there that Claire did, who was like one of his lifelong art friends. And she carefully studied this painting and really thought about it and thought about Matt, their connection. And she created that piece over there, which you'll see. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it was in storage since 1990, came out in 2020, 30 years. And the thing about it is, is that all, you know, the critique here is still the critique today. And, you know, maybe Phil can talk about that later too, but I, um, you know, I called Phil and said, what do you think? Can you let James know? And you know, and it seemed to be okay for me to show the work. So um, there it is. <laughs> uh, I'm Philip Rostek, um, and behind me is the oil tanker. 
the oil tanker was made in 1991. Now, if I make mistakes here as I as I talk into the microphone, please forgive me in advance. That was many years ago, and I'm a little bit fuzzy in my mind, but I remember most of the details. Uh, the oil tanker was a part of a larger presentation called the Labyrinth. I don't know if this is something that you can pick up in your film, but the Labyrinth was a collaborative effort of about 14 people. The oil tanker was a collaboration between three people, myself, Matt Werbeken, who was the chief archivist at the Warhol, and my friend Jim Nelson, an excellent painter. By structural collaboration, uh, that probably bears some explanation. In 1991, we had environmental concerns about oil spilling. An event was happening in the world at that time called the Gulf War. Inside our labyrinth presentation, the oil tanker was a kind of uh, attempt to show that this kind of thing that was happening in the world was a kind of modern minotaur. And so in the world of structural collaboration, I had the idea, and so it kind of worked this way. By consensus, we thought that the lab, like the oil tanker, should be in high perspective where it starts real little and the hull gets real big. As I had the idea, I said, I'll tour in the bottom, which will represent the water. My friend Matt Werbeken agreed to do all the oil based products inside the outline of the boat. And my friend Jim Nelson would paint it in a place and put in the background. And so every one of those three sections was a sacred kind of place where whatever input that the individual put in would be a kind of sacred input, not to be challenged by anybody else, but to, re, to be reinforced by positive reinforcement. And the oil tanker that you see behind me is the result. My friend Matt Werbeken saved oil-based products as thin as a credit card and as, uh, as large as a Clorox bottle for about six months in his basement. And there was room there for us to build the labyrinth and to work on it at our own pace. And so when we toured in the bottom and painted the oil-based products with spray paint, then my friend Jim put it in a place kind of reminiscent of his interpretation of the Gulf War. And the result is, I think, what we all consider to be structural collaboration. Um, at that point, I think that that hits the highlights of, of what this piece is about and how it came about. The labyrinth itself was an idea that I conceived as a member of the Digital Art Exchange That was an invention of Bruce Breeland at Carnegie Mellon University, and Matt Werbeken was a graduate student there. And in 1991, Bruce Breeland was retiring. Matt Werbeken was working at the Carnegie Museum during the Carnegie International, also archiving Bruce Breland's legacy at Carnegie Mellon and doing this labyrinth show with me in Pittsburgh, which was then touted by Patricia Lowry in the Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Press 
It's the most ambitious regional show ever produced here. It was a big deal. It was a big deal because Matt Rubikin had written a grant for the Painted Bride in Philadelphia, and we had $10,000 in our pocket. That enabled curator Murray Horn at the Pittsburgh Center for the Art in Pittsburgh to increase the amount of space for the show and gave us pretty much the entire National Gallery for our exhibit. And he matched our money with his own creativity and conviction to make a presentation that I'm very proud of to this day. So you've worked on the Rauschenberg Foundation? It, it, it was at the Rauschenberg Residency, which is part of the foundation. And, you know, uh, Rauschenberg really wanted to extend opportunities to artists that, you know, could be really transformative and give artists the opportunity to collaborate with people that they hadn't met before. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, we were in the studio down there and um, it's in Captiva, Florida and amazing studio. I, I just have to say like walking around that property you could see how his mind worked, right? How Rauschenberg's mind worked, you know? And being in that studio, it was like, it was meant for, you know, big work. It was great. So anyway, um, I had my sails hanging up in there. And, and uh, um, so he was an acrobat. And um, Acro Arno, Arno Kaisergus, who's, he was a, acrobat for Cirque du Soleil and he had the summer off or something and, and so he was doing all kinds of acrobatic things next to me and we just thought what are we doing we should be making photographs and collaborating so we did a bunch of photos together Arno would climb up trees and he would have his silks and they would flow out in the wind and the sails would be flowing and it was kind of this surreal space. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, these were images that I chose much later after the fact because I was really interested in their surreal quality and um, not so much the dramatic, you know, a little mysterious and strange and like sort of like dreams and, so this piece here, um, I was in Galveston, Texas, and it was a year after <clears throat> Hurricane Ike, and we were driving along, and I saw these wrecked ships just sitting there. And so I went over to investigate a little more, and it turned out that they had just been dredged up from the Gulf, um, to like prove to the insurance company that their boat had been affected by Hurricane Ike. So, and then, you know, I, I, you know, I shot a bunch of different, I shot like this on four by five sheet film and I, uh, you know, scanned it in and did some manipulation to kind of give this sort of X-ray quality to the piece. And that's the story there. So these are cylindrical. Can you tell me about the materials and the process behind creating some of these? Um, so <clears throat> I was getting a lot of, you know, things shipped. So I made these in 2019. And I would just be sitting at my table in my studio. And I would like start crafting you know, little ships from the stuff that's being shipped to me from wherever. Um, so I would get the boxes and I would cut them out and I'd make little, you know, boxes that kind of look like ships and I'd cover them with plaster and then I'd find just stuff in the studio and just started making 
all these little pieces out of scrap. And then I realized, like, oh, uh, I have the, the way the lighting was in the studio. I could really play around with that. So I set them up as if they were on a horizon line. And the point was I wanted to connect all the horizon lines and make this whole series. But my life is a little bit fragmented, you know, so I just couldn't stay in one place for the length of time that I really need to work on these. So I just started making separate prints. So these prints were printed at Marshall University in West Virginia. And I was there to do an exhibition. So I you know, sent them the files and then they made the prints there so I could exhibit them. And uh, yeah, so that's where these came from. <laughs> 